Sharon today, taking this lesson especially. We had one person on our team who had to back out at the last minute, and so I was going to have to take lots more, and Sharon uh, offered to do this, so I'm so grateful for her. So let's, um, let's pray for Sharon and expect God to teach us through her today. God, we are so grateful for all that you have revealed to us as we have studied your word this week in Revelation 3. What an amazing God you are. And God, we do want you to be our vision always. You've promised in these words to give us spiritual sight. So, so many things in that song um, we saw in Revelation 3. And so we just praise you. We worship you. We glorify your name. And now we're asking you, God, to help us to see something new as as you have taught your servant, Sharon, and now she's going to share with us. Would you give her courage? Would you give her wisdom? And would you help us to see and hear something new? We love you, God, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies, we have been on a wonderful journey this spring as we've read the letters of a loving disciple who is an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. John has reminded us that we are to walk in obedience, light, and love, abide in fellowship with him, in unity with God and one another, and test the spirits. In the past two weeks, we've seen encouragement for those abiding in truth, Correction for those who are not, and warning of duty and responsibility for his people, the church. And we've seen that the faithful overcomers are promised great rewards at Christ's return. This week, we will see three more churches clearly through the eyes of Jesus. A dead church, a loving church, and a lukewarm church. We will see a preview, a problem, a petition, a praise, and a promise. So please open your Bibles to Revelation 3 and follow along with me. In verses 1 through 6, it says, And to the angels of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy." The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here is a map of Sardis. It was the capital city of Lydia and is located in modern-day Turkey. It was a commercial center established on an important trade route, and it was a leading producer of gold, so it was very wealthy. Gold and silver coins were first minted here, and it was known for its jewelry, its dye, and textiles, as well as being famous for industry. It is a center of pagan worship, and like Ephesus, had a temple for the worship of the goddess Artemis. Now this is the picture of Sardis. It was a unique city in that it sat up on the top of a 1,500-foot high plateau with only one narrow road leading up to it. All the other sides were steep cliffs, so it was most difficult to invade. It was a great city under the rule of King Croesus, but it fell to Cyrus in 547 BC when one of his men noticed that a soldier at the top of the wall dropped his helmet and then he dropped down and used a secret path back up a cliff. This gave Persia an unexpected entrance, so while the guards slept that night, Cyrus's army invaded and conquered. This city never regained its wealth or its power, and when Romans gained control, the church in Sardis had become indifferent and apathetic. So let's look at the person who's talking to this church. It's Jesus, the sovereign and omniscient one who knows all. This is not a casual knowledge, but one that is completely seen and perfectly understood. 
Hebrews 4.13 says that neither there is any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open to his eyes. And Proverbs 15.3 tells us that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. There is absolutely nothing hidden from Jesus. Just as God saw Hagar's need in the wilderness, Ruth's need for a kinsman redeemer, and David's sins of adultery and murder, he saw the hearts in Sardis as he sees the hearts of his people today. Now the problem was that Sardis had a reputation of being alive. They were strong and effective, but God says they're dead. Their outward appearance looked good and looked like the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. This church was a whitewashed tomb rather than a secure fortress. They were full of hypocrisy, outwardly strong, beautiful, and full of life, but inwardly weak, unclean, and dying. As 1 Timothy 3, 5 says, it held to a form of godliness, but it denied God's power. His petition here, wake up and be watchful. This admonition is in present imperative, which means it's a command to be continually awake and continually watchful. Take action, strengthen what is left, and keep doing so. Finish what you've begun because your work is not complete. Remember what you've been taught, rehearse it, and guard it. Wake up and repent. If you don't, I'm going to come like a thief and you aren't going to be expecting me. You'll be caught unaware just like this city in Sardis when it was invaded. In Ephesians 6, it gives us the exhortation to put on the full armor of God and be ready for warfare at all times. We must be alert, unlike Sardis, so we can battle effectively. Remember, 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us that the enemy is prowling around like a lion, ready to devour. So ladies, armor up. The praise here is that there are a few who remain faithful and have not sold their garments. There's a remnant. This reminds us of the days of Elijah when he thought he was the only faithful servant left of God's, but then he found out that God had preserved 500 um, prophets through Obadiah who hid them in caves to protect them from Jezebel. God kept a remnant then, and he keeps a remnant today. And as for his promises, I will bring forth life from this lifeless church. The ones in Sardis who have not sold their garments were the people undoubtedly walking in light and love and keeping themselves unstained by the world. These overcomers will be clothed in white garments of salvation and righteousness provided by Christ as prophesied in Isaiah 61.10. And how does this happen? 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, God has made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. So those redeemed by his precious blood will wear white robes of righteousness. Finally, those in Sardis who overcame, they have not denied his name, and they have not, will not have their names written out of the book of life. In these times, when someone died, uh, their names were in a city registry. And when they died, it was blotted out. So this was a very, very secure message, ensuring life to these people. Also, Christ says that he will confess them before his Father and his angels, reminding us of Matthew 10, 32, when Jesus says, Whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father in heaven. So let's look at verses 7 through 13, and if you'll read along with me. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world 
to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, when I spoke to you in 1 John, I called your attention to the word behold. We see it four times in this uh, small passage, so I think it's important to remember what it means. It means pay attention. Listen, this is urgent. Jesus says, behold, I have set before you an open door. This reminds me of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, to go and spread the gospel to all the nations. Then behold, I will cause even those of Satan to worship at your feet. And lastly, behold, I'm coming quickly, accenting uh, certainty and authority. In preview, Philadelphia, you can see where it's located right here, was an agricultural area but was plagued by earthquakes and volcanoes, so it was destroyed several times. Here's a picture of the ruins. It was a city located between two mountain ranges and was considered the doorway between Asia and Asia Minor. The Greeks once used this city to introduce Greek culture and language to the world, and later this was a door to Christianity. This city of brotherly love was a military buffer, so it was peaceful, and the church was considered dependable, dedicated, and devoted, even though it was weak. Jesus proclaims here that he's the real and genuine God, holy, true, and faithful. Revelation 19.11 confirms this later when it says Jesus comes back, he's going to be called faithful and true. He calls the key of David, which is a reference, as we studied in our lesson, to Isaiah 22, when he, King Hezekiah said of his servant Eliakim that he would clothe him in a robe of strength and commit his government to him. He would lay the key of the house of David upon his shoulders so that no one could shut what he had opened. This scripture reveals a type of God's servant, Jesus, who has power, authority, and access to the king. The problem is that Philadelphia lacked strength. But remember, God's word says in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29, that he has chosen the weak things of this world to display his strength so that no flesh receives his glory. Because of their faithfulness, love, and obedience, even in their weakness, God strengthened them, and he does the same for his people today. He praises them for keeping his word and not denying his name. These believers obviously have been faithful to live out God's commands and have passed the test of righteousness, love, and truth that we've been talking about this semester. They've proved by their actions that they love the Father and others. They were abiding in fellowship with God and with one another while proclaiming his gospel to the world through their open door. They didn't operate out of wealth, power, or self-determination, but out of strength and power of the Holy Spirit. They made much of Jesus. His petition is that he counsels them to hold fast, which means to remain faithful, cling to him, keep abiding so that no man will take the reward. And he encourages them to look to the eternal, not the temporal. His promise he says, I love you, and you will rule beside me at my throne. He will cause all the antichrists and false teachers to come and worship him at their feet. As Philippians 2, 10 and 11 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus said he will keep them from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the world. Now, I love this thought of being kept. It reminds me of God, my rock, my security, strength, and safety. Psalm 18, 2 and 3 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 
I call upon the name of the Lord and am worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. This shows Christ's continual presence and also his strength, provision, and protection as he keeps his people. He will make overcomers pillars in the temple of his God. This is significant because pillars are the strength of a building. In this time, people who were important were honored in pagan temples with a pillar engraved with their name. So this church would have understood how amazing this would be to be pillars in the temple of their God. They might be small, insignificant, or weak here on earth, but Jesus is promising them that they will be honored, strong, and secure before the Father in his kingdom. These pillars also remind us of the trees in the Garden of Eden, which provided fruit and life. The, uh, Psalm 92, 12 through 15 says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar. And those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God and bring forth fruit. They will be strong, and in his presence they will bear good fruit eternally. Lastly, he says, the overcomers have a new name. So those who were once dead in sin, strangers to the covenant of promise, are now fellow citizens and saints, pillars in God's temple, forever bearing his name. So let's look at verses 14 through 19, and if you'll read along with me. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Now here's a map of Laodicea. And it's about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. It, too, had been destroyed by earthquakes, but unlike Philadelphia, it was wealthy enough to rebuild. The city was on a high plateau, so it was very secure from enemy attacks like Sardis. Here are some pictures of some ruins from that area. It was famous for a center of banking, finance, and wealth. It was a fashion center dealing in black wool and produced luxury clothing and rugs. There was also a medical school here that produced a tablet that when it was crushed and added to oil or water would make a salve to treat eye diseases. But Laodicea had a major problem. It had a lack of water supply. In their ingenuity, they built these aqueducts to pipe in water from Colossae from the east and Heropolis from the north. However, by the time the cold, refreshing water from Colossae reached them, it would be lukewarm. And by the time the hot, medicinal waters of Heropolis got there, it too was lukewarm. So the person speaking to Laodicea is Jesus, our amen, which de denotes certainty, a faithful, true witness in the beginning of all creation. As we discussed in our homework, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in Colossians 1, it states that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the beginning of all creation. He has made all things, he's before all things, and by him all things exist. Then in Hebrews 10, 7, the Word says that Jesus said he came to do his Father's will and he was faithful to fulfill his mission. Now the problem with this church was that it was self-sufficient. It was complacent, lukewarm like their water. They held a false sense of security due to their prosperity and wealth, and their deeds manifested their heart's attitude. Jesus is identifying their physical problem with their spiritual problem. He longed for them to be either cold, refreshing and restoring, or hot, zealous and passionate, a true picture of who he is. 
but their lukewarm faith had become passionless. There is absolutely no praise for this church, but there's a strong plea. The faithful and true one counsels them to buy refined gold of Jesus with a living and holy sacrifice of their lives, as we read in Romans 12 a few years ago. He desires them to be passionate and take up their cross and follow him. He longs for them to abide in the fellowship and to be renewed through the power of his word and his spirit. He pleads for them to be clothed in white garments instead of the black wool that they were accustomed to. In Christ's eyes, they were naked, and he longs for them to be covered in his robe of righteousness. Now, this caused me to reflect on Genesis 3, 7, when in the garden, Adam and Eve sinned, and they tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves to cover their nakedness. Those leaves were not sufficient, and nor is the fashionable black wool clothing from Laodicea. Remember Jesus' parable in Matthew 22, which stated that the king approached the wedding guest that was not dressed in his wedding garment that he provided? The man was thrown out into the darkness. He thought his clothing was adequate, but it wasn't. How many of us do this? We attend church, come to Bible study, we serve in various ways, but these ladies are filthy rags according to Isaiah 64, 6. We must be clothed in the righteous robes of Christ, not garments of work and self-righteousness. Next, Christ also offers a better ISAV, one that will cure their spiritual blindness so they can see truth. After all, he is the way, the truth, and the life, the light of the world who can deliver them from the domain of darkness and transfer them to his marvelous light as seen in 1 Peter 2.9. His promise, riches that are better than gold, pure white garments to cover their nakedness and true spiritual sight if they will walk in his light. Then he gently reminds them that he rebukes and chastens those he loves. Okay, let's read verses 20 through 22. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcome and sat with my father on his throne. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's that word behold again. So let's stop and pay attention. Behold, I stand. The word stand is in the perfect tense, which means Jesus has been standing, he is standing, and he will continue to stand and knock. This verse reveals Christ's deep desire and commitment to intimate fellowship with his family. He longs to abide with them and is waiting patiently, but one must open the door and let him in. He will not force his way. Notice on this picture, the artist um, did not put a door handle on the outside, uh, which indicates that it must be open from within. He then promises that he will seat them by himself on his throne, where they will share in his authority, power, and honor. They will abide with the Father in glory as they worship, adore, and praise him in spirit and truth. They will live in unity with, and fellowship with the Trinity and with other saints forever because John 16, tells us Jesus has overcome. So when I finished this chapter, I asked myself, what did I learn about God in Revelation 3? Well, we see that God is present, personal, persistent, patient, and powerful. He is revealer reprover, restorer, and rewarder. Our sovereign God sees and knows all. He is the beginning, faithful and true, holy and righteous, and our counselor and creator. He is our rock, our safety, our security. He is able, he is authority, and he is amen. God is our sovereign judge and our righteous ruler. He is king, keeper, and overcomer yet he longs to have a personal fellowship with his sinful people. 
In conclusion, I want to remind you of Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2, which is where she states, There is no rock like our God. He is a God of knowledge, and by him all things are weighed and judged. So what would Christ say to TBC? First, I know your works. Then, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So I ask, are we prideful, strong, and self-sufficient? Are we wealthy, yet poor and blind, worshiping idols of self, power, and greed? Are we loveless and dead, or loving and life-giving? Are we faithful to obey him, walking in love and light, shining in the darkness? Are we loving the vulnerable, the weak, and the poor? Are we passionately portraying Jesus through our open door? Are we making much of Jesus? Recently, I watched our body walk through a trial with a family who was in deep suffering. I saw Christ before my very eyes in the surrender of time, service, money, and possessions. I witnessed the hospitality and generosity of God's people as they selflessly provided meals and encouragement for these precious brothers and sisters in Christ, many of whom were strangers. I experienced broken-hearted people hurting and weeping alongside this precious family while interceding for them. Such an outpouring of Christ's love is overwhelming and so beautiful but it should not be extraordinary. This should be the extinctive norm, an abiding church actively pursuing the Lord, living in light and love, and always ready to open, go through their open door. I dare say Jesus would commend this outpouring of love, for it is a picture of sacrifice and surrender of our Lord as he poured out his life for us. Behold, our God, the Christ and his spirit working in his church. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word, for your correction and your loving discipline. Thank you for your patience. We ask that you open our hearts and eyes to see as you see and give us strength to obey all that you desire. Build our faith as we journey through life and give us wisdom and discernment to walk in obedience unity, light, and love, so the world will know that you alone are God. To you be all glory, honor, and praise through Christ Jesus, our Savior, and your Holy Son. Amen. Yeah, let's thank Sharon. I just want to say before you go how very proud I am of our entire team, and I hope that, that you'll take a minute just to say thank you to Sharon and to Karen Jennings and to Haley Rojas and to Denise Gilbert. Um, 